Hello, everyone, and welcome to Harbor Time Strategy Talks. I'm your host, Colin Harbor, and I know it's been a few weeks since we talked, but we're back, and, and this next grouping or this next season of podcasts is going to be better than ever. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to share, like, comment, and subscribe. All of your feedback is very useful and very helpful, and I always appreciate it. Um, so I don't know what to say about today's guest. I, I'm very excited personally because I've watched her and her company over the last few months. If you look at companies that are changing the way social media business and, and social marketing is done, I think you should look no further than Lately AI and its co-founder and CEO, Kate Bradley Chernus. I first heard of the company on LinkedIn from a Gary Vaynerchuk post and, you know, I always read his stuff and listen to his stuff and try to copy him and maybe one day I'll be as successful as him. But I thought to myself, hey, if this is good enough for Gary, then it's good enough for me. So I started following the company and noticed an extremely energetic individual by the name of Kate, sometimes even going by Kately. Um, she was she was everywhere, podcasting, videos, and, and she is now, too, and just putting out great information. Um, I filled out a form on their website and heard from a guy named Chris Bro, B-R-O. His, his last name is spelled a little bit different than that, but he went with Chris Bro. So I thought, all right, I, I like this company already even more, and I'm going to go with it. So he did a demo. We talked through it, and I signed up the next day. So Again, Kate's company, Lately AI, uses artificial intelligence to create and plan social media posts off of a blog, an article, um, a video. So, for instance, you could take a 15, 10 minute, 20 minute video, upload it to Lately. Somehow, Kate's back there. She churns out real fast, breaks it down into 10, 12, 15 second chunks, um, depending on which option you select and creates 30, 40, 50 posts for you that you can massage a little bit if you want to, that you can schedule. So for instance, I had two or three podcasts that I scheduled eight weeks and it was you know basically 100 or 150 tweets and I didn't have to do anything after that and it took little time. Um, it, it's a great company and, and, and a great idea and, and, and I've really enjoyed using it. So last night I actually went out to Lately's LinkedIn page and I, I thought, this is the greatest hits of some of Kate's uh, podcasts and videos. So, it, it, you know, you go through their website or you, you scroll down on LinkedIn and you see 10 seconds here, 15 seconds here, eight seconds here. But you get such good information. And that's what their uh, their AI, their artificial intelligence uh, does. So as I've watched Kate over the last few months, I've noticed uh, a couple of things. One is she's on a mission. And I don't just mean a, a business mission for lately. Um, but she also identifies other issues that need a little addressing from time to time, such as how women are treated in the private equity world, or for that matter, how women are treated uh, in, in the larger landscape of business, if you will. And I have two daughters and a wife, so I'm obviously very interested in that topic. Um, I think if you think she's going to be quiet about those issues, I think you're sadly mistaken. And we may cover some of that in just a few minutes. So another cool thing about Kate uh, from her past is that she was a DJ. That's right. A real DJ on the radio or whatever it was at the time. She's a DJ turned C uh, CEO and what I consider a social media legend. So hopefully we'll get a chance to do some DJ talk sometime. But Hey, Kate, thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who is Kate Bradley Chernus and what is Lately AI? Hey, Colin, that's the best intro. Um, thank you so much. And um, if, if you're, well, since you've been so nice, I'm doing my radio voice for you right now. I see. There How's you that? go. That's great. <laughs> I've, always wanted, I've wanted a DJ voice myself, but I don't have one. So, okay. It took lots of practice, by the way, and I remember overdoing it and being too breathy, you know, and then maybe being too nasally and really, really having to hone it in very much the same way we all hone in our marketing voice in either writing or the persona you take on in your podcast. You're still you, but it's a little bit, slightly a little bit different, you know, we call it, or I like to call it um, intentional authenticity. Right, meaning it's okay. authentically you, but you're you're pulling out 
something specific that's a little bit not the same way you might talk to your mom, for example, or to a friend, but it's your business persona for, you know, whatever the medium. But yeah, so you got everything right. I used to be a rock and roll DJ. My last gig was broadcasting to 20 million listeners a day for XM satellite radio. And uh, that was a wild ride. I I loved it and hated it. It was a combination of yeah, yeah. I mean, radio was fun because there, of course, were lots of perks. I mean, um, I got to meet meet Keith Richards, and he's just as weird as and wonderful as you think he is. You know, um, among other, I met my husband. I was I was telling you before we started recording there, and so job hazard. I used to date a lot of musicians, right? I mean, <laughs> it was part of the part of the deal, but. Um, and I learned a lot about turning listeners into fans. So that's a big difference than just a listener. The same way there's a difference between a customer and an evangelist, right? And that's what I got really good at learning how to do. Like, how do I speak to millions of people, but make you feel like I'm only talking to just you? And it's the same thing that we doing our marketing every day and you're doing you do a great job of it on your podcast right that's the magic of when you're doing well um and you when you wield the mic and you do it well that's that's what what you um strive for i believe so um between radio and lately i had a marketing agency (laughs) too and um that was kind of a wild story which i'm happy to dive into if you like but the the short highlight is my first client was Walmart, hooray, and I ended up designing a spreadsheet system for them that got us 130% ROI year over year for three years, <laughs> which ended up being the um, the blueprint, you might say, for what we do at Lately. Okay. And that was the Kate Bradley Chernus proprietary spreadsheet, I'm, I'm assuming? That's the one. Yeah, it was. I mean, for the nerds in the room, in case there are any, it was quite a spreadsheet because this was a very complicated project. It was Walmart along with the Walmart Foundation and all of their franchises and the IRS, so for profit and government, and then nonprofits, so National Disability Institute, United Way Worldwide, and all their franchises. Plus, we had ATT and Bank of America. So, a really unique. Um, coming together of people. They were supporting a good cause. And um, it was not only these large national companies, but then tens of thousands of non other nonprofit and small companies as well, from libraries, for example, to local banks. And so when I came into that, you know, I came from a place of radio, Colin, which radio is a wild west still. It's 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 not particularly even though XM was, I guess, as corporate as I, as I had gotten, it's um, it's renegade. Like it's what I like. What I like about it is that it's lawless, right? Now, as you were pointing out, like some of that lawlessness means um, sexual harassment, which is not a fun, you know, work environment. But it was so normal when I was there that even I participated into it because it was just part of the culture. I didn't know it was wrong, you know, but. Um, so so with the Walmart project, when I came in, you know, I basically I said right away, wow, this is such a freaking mess because <laughs> that was my style, you know, that lawless style. And they raised an eyebrow and I went home and I built this spreadsheet that was really designed to organize all these people and all the marketing they were doing, not only what was happening. So were we building YouTube videos, social media, blogs, like keeping track of what was being created and where it was going and, and the analytics around it and, and really getting granular. Um, so so going out to all 20,000 participants and asking them, can I see your analytics, right, for the stuff that we're doing together, which is crazy because I have that OCD nature, but I knew we needed to know the whole story to really get to the meat of it. But at the same time, we were breaking down the actual content itself and looking at the writing and the problems that everybody was having. And they were literally nobody wanted to do the writing which is amazing right marketers at the largest retailer in the world hate writing it's true mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, the the spreadsheet yeah. you you hate it too yeah yeah 
yeah, so you know. Um, so yeah, so I started looking at content we were already creating, like a blog, for example, and then breaking it down and saying, well, the title of this doesn't seem particularly interesting, maybe to the world who doesn't know about this cause, but the the sentences inside are kind of like teasers, little windows to what the full story is about. So let's use each one as a social post in its in its own right with a link back to the full story and see if that will drive traffic. And it did. And we wouldn't do just one. We would find every possible good sentence we could find. So maybe 40 for one blog and then schedule them out over time. So they felt organic, right? Sure. So that is the genesis of the idea of lately AI. When did you, when did you wake up and say, hmm, I'm going to start a company? <laughs> I didn't. Um, so my, it was, it was sort of, it was a, it was a confluence of a number of events. So between XM and my agency, I had, first of all, my, I had, um, my, my body started to just break down. I was under so much stress because it was a very hostile work environment. And at the time that wasn't a term that was around. So I didn't know what that was. I could, you know, I just knew that something felt weird. Mm -hmm. And why was it that whenever I had successes that I either wasn't getting credit for them or I was, um, people were threatened by me. It was really clear. And I, I didn't understand. I was like, I'm doing something awesome. Why aren't you, why aren't you rah rahing me? You know, and instead like tr making really, really trying to make my job harder. And so um, I started having panic attacks. Um, I had a huge rash in my torso that no one could explain. I fell down the stairs and uh, tore a ligament in, in my ankle and re-injured it. So I was like on crutches or in a wheelchair for like a year, more than a year. And I was this disaster. And um, then I couldn't use my hands anymore. I wasn't able to type. So I had this tremendous pain throughout my hands and, and arms. And no one would help me. No one believed me because I looked normal, Colin. I mean, I have hands, right? And so I ended up hiring an intern myself because they wouldn't get one for me to literally sit at my desk and I would tell him what to type. And it wasn't just typing emails. It was hand mixing the sound and pushing the button to hit record so I could record my voice tracks for the day. Right. Um, and then at some point I, this, you know, I just was terrified and I was trying to research, you know, how am I going to go forward in this world like this? So I found Dragon Naturally Speaking, which is um, like voice activated software that you use mm -hmm. to, okay talk to your computer, right? Yeah. Um, so people, lots of people use it now, but the one I use is for people who are paraplegics who can't use their hands at all. And, and I, I found a coach to help me. This was a new idea back then. Only about three or four people existed who really knew it. And I paid her in CDs because <laughs> I didn't have any money. <laughs> um, and she helped me because it's mm -hmm. very, it's like CDs. learning a language. So yeah, I had like a couple hundred CDs, all rock and roll. Um, some of them were from my husband's band, Ryan Adams, big Ryan Adams fan. Uh, you know, it was, my my show was the new music show on our channel. So it was mostly new music right. of the time. So this is like not 2004, 2005. Yeah, a little while ago. Um, so then I, I ended up moving to a different company. And it was another music company and it was the same thing. I got there. They didn't understand why I couldn't type like everybody else, why I required, I required special assistance. I had to have a, a room that was close. I had to have my own office because the microphone hears everything. And so now I'm looked upon like a pain in the ass because I need special treatment. Right. And so I was crying all the time. And I think this is important. I'm glad that you mentioned that your, your daughters and your wife, because I didn't know what was happening to me. and. I was being gaslit. People told me that I was wrong or oversensitive or overreacting or I couldn't possibly in this kind of pain. And I believed them because I had so much self-doubt and I was so scared, right? And my dad, one day, he saw me crying all the time when I was smoking. I used to smoke a lot. I'm a very good smoker. <laughs> and uh, he shook me by the shoulders and said, <laughs> you can't work for other people. And there's no shame in that. So that was the 
big like aha of how then I started my marketing agency and, and started my first company, right? And um, it was lucky because, you know, that catalyst of having somebody see what you don't see, Colin, I feel like mm -hmm. I know that I need that often. And I, the important thing is you need the catalyst, but you also then have to have the presence of mind to recognize the door is being open for you, right? And go through it, you know? So in sure. that week, I, my husband bought me a startup book, a famous book on, on startups called Guy Kawasaki's Art of the Start. And I read um, the first chapter or so, and Guy says, don't make a plan, just get started. And I heard that advice and I thought, oh, I understand what he's saying. What he mean it, means is like, there's no one that can really tell me how to go down this new journey that no one has ever done before. I have to do it on my own. So I stopped reading the book because I realized it wasn't going to be useful <laughs> anymore. And then I went to lunch by accident um, with a couple of clients that wanted to meet me in person because they were fans of my channel at XM. They were fans of my show. And they happened to be angel investors. So they gave me $50,000 that week to start my first company, um, which actually was a music-related company. And then we morphed it into the agency. Um, and then from there, I met one of my co-founders, just again, an accident, who saw the spreadsheets that I made from Walmart and saw what I didn't see. You know, he's the one that, sa that said, oh, you know, you can automate this into software and we can scale it and make money. And I was like, what? Well, you know, that that is an important thing for entrepreneurs to realize, I think, is that it, it doesn't hurt to have people looking out for you. It doesn't hurt to share your ideas with people over lunch. And it doesn't hurt every now and then to have an angel investor come in and help help push you along, right? I mean, I, I know some people may say it's luck or this, that, and the other, but it's not. It's a series of events. It's a it's a timeline of things that happen. But if you weren't doing those things, you might not have started lately AI, right? I mean, th these things have yeah. to happen. Yeah, and the mindset I think is important too, right? So it, it's part part luck, but it's also part being willing to be in the place for those things to happen. Like I was also, um, so I was taking action, right? I was seeing acupuncturists and, and all kinds of healers. I'd, I'd done Western medicine, Eastern medicine. And so I was trying to work on my body because the physical pain was what was driving me. But then I realized that perhaps my mental state <laughs> was also a huge problem here. Um, and so I was reading some self-help books, which I, I hated doing because I just have, they have a stigma for me, but I was slogging through it anyways, because I just knew like I had to find the answer. And so I think that's a big part of it. I mean, I like to call it, it's a little bit manifest destiny, right, Colin? You know, when, when, the, the mind is so powerful. They're, they're not joking about that one, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? So let's talk then a little bit about evangelists or, or your, your customers. We talked to, briefly about it. You touched on it. Let's put it that way. So I recently heard you say that Lately's goal is not sales, but to create evangelists. That's an interesting concept because on one side, it's easy to say, Without sales, there can't be a business. And I know you're not necessarily saying that, right? Or not necessarily, you know that you've got to generate revenue to have a business, right? So that's not necessarily what you're saying, but let's explore the concept of evangelists for your business and how a company can create evangelists. So a small, really any size company, but I know there's some small companies, small business owners who listen to this. How can they create an evangelist for their company? Yeah, it's it's funny because we started it this way in the beginning, right from the beginning, because that's what I know how to do really well, right? Whether it was being on the air for XM or any of the other radio stations I worked for, or even working with the Walmart project, that those are both B to C experiences, right? Where you're like looking to light up individuals. <sighs> and I knew the power of of word of mouth. My my father was in retail for a long time. Um and obviously, you know, being on the radio and, and being around musicians and stuff like that. And 
I had been in sales before as well. I'd done, I've done um, fundraising for nonprofits and I did fundraising for my um, college from as an alum, and then I had done other sales work. And so I knew the power of getting someone on the phone, for example, or getting the meeting. And then I had also been around enough, you know, I'd been to South by Southwest early on when the interactive had just started those first four or five years when Gary made his first, Gary V made his first appearance there. And so their social media was so new and we were all experimenting with blogging and MySpace and emails. And so I led that, that charge for my channel at, at XM. And so I'd seen also what the difference was between sending out a blast email versus having an individual meeting, right? the one to many kind of idea and what a voice how how making mistakes would benefit us <laughs> for example how being that unpolished self that i am naturally benefits us because people expect the stiff right they <laughs> and when you're the opposite of what they expect it gets it makes people lean forward so when we do our marketing externally and then even when we actually meet you as a potential customer and then when you become a customer and how we treat you afterwards you know this colin it's the same we're always um speaking directly to you as an individual and thinking that evangelism piece is so important because you're going to sell lately for me right so i'm only as powerful as me but if i get hundreds of me's then we win heavy duty, right? And as a small company that nobody knows, I mean, I'm not, I'm not Hootsuite, <laughs> right? I'm, right? I'm not, certainly not Amazon. I need as much help as I can get. So that's the other thing I knew from working in the nonprofit sector is that when you don't really have leverage on your own, you have to ask others for help, right? We're all in this together. You've heard people say that. And I'm also a fan of public radio, because they go back to the well like all the time, which is really hard to do, right? Mm -hmm. How do they do that so well? I'm not, and forget your politics, it doesn't matter, but just the function of like fundraising on a constant basis is very difficult to do. So the evangelism piece became um, an essential component to us because also we have the luxury of learning, right? We're small enough that we're constantly learning from you and other people. And so it doesn't really matter if you don't become a customer because you're going to give us some information and, and still level us up. Um, sure. And we found also that this is a long answer. Sorry. No, that's good. <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> we found also that a lot of people want to be lately customers, but they're not qualified yet because it really is for an advanced marketer and we feel bad about that. We want to have a product for these people, but it's just not in the cards for us yet. There's a lot of reasons why. Um, and so we've learned that we can use them, leverage their enthusiasm specifically so that we don't um, we don't waste out on, the, how do I say this? But the enthusiasm is something you don't wanna crush, right? And it's hard for me to say, no, you can't be my customer. <laughs> I feel bad about that. Um, so having lighting them up and, and giving them a way to feel involved in another way we found to be um, useful for us. Yeah, well, I, I feel like the the whole concept of, of evangel evangelist for your company is great. and and I do think that lately and and you and your team has done a great job of it. Even down to the, I don't know. I, I may tweet something, and and then lately, and you, and maybe somebody else that lately likes it, right? And I notice those things, and I'm like, all right, well, these these lately people are really on my side. So I'm I'm going to, besides the fact that I really like the the the, the software or, or whatever we call it, and, and I'm using it probably not as much as I need to because sometimes I just. I have to take the kids to soccer practice or I have to do other things too, right? But no, I, I think you guys, you, you do a great job of that. And, and, and I think a lot of businesses, small businesses, small companies, I, I'm serious and, and I'm not getting paid to say this, right? I think they should look to how Lately is pushing out their content and their 
message to the world to come up with ideas about how, how they can do it. That, that, that's what I would suggest. But I'm going to skip a question I've got here. I've tears in my eyes. Thank you. Oh, well, okay. I didn't mean to make you cry, but oh, they're tears of joy, I'm No, sure. in a good way. It's joy. That's the nicest thing anyone could say. Thank you. Right. So I'm skipping the next question because we've kind of covered that. But what what has been your biggest surprise in the last few months and why? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, there was a bad one. <laughs> um, you know, it's amazing to me how how we constantly have to learn the same lessons. And this is a human, this is a human um, experience, I think, not just at work, but in your life. I feel like I'm constantly, you know, whether it's, um, you know, if I personally, if I have wine and popcorn, I'm going to be bloated the next day, but still I want to have it, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and um, right. Um, and then, and there's stuff like that. Like we, we're in a process right now of um, rethinking how we qualify customers and having to do a harder job of disqualifying them um, because the residual pain of it really hurts us. And so we, we know what those components are. And yet sometimes I need to consistently remind the team about it. Or for example, you know, I, I have all these, as you, I have all these things going on, you know, as anybody does. And so I have lots of people and things in place for me so that I can get snapshots, right. And glean, glean insight. And so I don't often enough dive down into the depths of the things. Um, and when I don't, it catches up every once in a while. And we, un we uncover some, something that makes me want to just gouge my eyeballs out and say like, are you kidding me? Oh my God. And it's nobody's fault except for mine in the end, right? Because I'm the CEO. And it's not so much that it surprises me, but it's sort of like, it's that I could have had a V8 type of thing. Like, you know, I'm just like, I can't believe we're here again. <laughs> Haven't we evolved? But um, I, it's just because there's so many things going on at once. Um, I will say the thing that, that continues to surprise me, Colin, is you people like you like I? I woke up in the middle of the night the other night and I thought to myself, out of our five hundred or so customers and our ninety five thousand dollars monthly recurring revenue, I I I really genuinely think that people only buy us because they like us. This is my thought in the middle of the night. Like, have I really produced a product that that is actually any good? Um, and I really like I really get into that place and think that you know, um. And that, that, that self-doubt creeps in because there's so many um, exterior uh, um, arrows <laughs> being sure. shot at you all the time, right? And I guess the one thing uh, to answer this question even more is that surprises me is my my team's ability to lift me up. You know, I I do a really good job of uniting us and supporting them and I know I do that. I take a lot of effort to do that, but I, I am also can be a bear, you know, and I, I can also, the negativity bleeds out when I'm in that dark place. I can't, I can't really help. I can't hide it, you know, and it's hard. Um, but they, they tell me I do a good job. I'm the CEO. Do you know anybody who tells their CEO they do a good job? <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty well, awesome. Sometimes it depends on if it's paycheck day or, you know, um, annual review time, <laughs> you know, th then they all say, you're doing yeah. job, but, you know, <laughs> that's true. I need that, you know, even I don't need it too often, but it, I'm always delighted when they do it. Well, good. So let me ask you this. We, we talked a little bit about it, or I mentioned it in my introduction, and, and I know you have talked about this some, and you talked about maybe a little bit of a hostile work environment type deal, may, maybe related to a couple of different issues, but I don't know that I necessarily want you to take the gloves completely off here, but I am going to ask, what's it like being a female entrepreneur and business leader in a male-dominated world or male-dominated corporate environment. I, I don't know the right way to ask the question, but I think you know what I'm asking. Yeah. Thanks for asking that question. I think that the the thing I've learned the most is to re recognize what's what's happening when it's not not good and 
um, be, know that sometimes I can't deal in the situation. Sometimes I let it happen to me. And it's not until after the fact, right, that you walk out of the room and you're like, what the hell was that? Why didn't I say something? You know, um, and it's okay to feel that way. And I found that if afterwards I can share that either maybe with my female or male um, counterparts at work or with somebody else, just just knowing that I was I had the wherewithal to see it. Um, gives me the ability to see it in the future and to let others know, right? So that they can see it. So that's been the the best thing. Um, really understanding, like when I came into this this particular world of technology and startup life, um, I was a tomboy, Colin. Um, I've, I have women friends. It's not like I don't, but like I'm not interested in like going off on a all female you know, spa trip or something. <laughs> it's not my thing, you know? Right. And I had this, um, yeah, like I had this stigma again about what what women and women's groups and women collectives were about. And people kept trying to push me into that box and it was annoying to me, you know, because I didn't realize how bad it was. Now, now I do. <laughs> and um, now I understand my duty in lifting others up, not only women, but any underdogs, doesn't matter, it's guys as well. And the the interesting thing there that my a friend of mine, Jen, actually pointed out was that in order to get lifted up, you have to appeal to the person in power, right? So there's, there's two parts of the equation. So I need I need rich white guys. <laughs> I need them. <laughs> I need them to lift me up. Right, in the same way that when it's my turn to lift the next person up, they're going to need me, whoever it is. So that's it's an interesting thing. You can't just you can't just eighty six the problem from the equation because they're part of the right. solution, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you this: to, to ask, the question is, how has it been? I wish I had a picture of my face that I could point to before startup and then now because. Um, I have eye bags, which I didn't have before. <laughs> right. I do too. I, I was noticing on the video that I do right now, but yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> <clears throat> well, yeah. you know, I, I think that was a good answer. And I wasn't asking, I wasn't hoping, like I wasn't trying to be provocative. I wasn't hoping for a rant and rave or anything because I, I think it's an important issue. I have a feeling that I'm probably guilty of some things too, right? Some of it is in, intentional that the ways that people act. Some of it, it maybe just is subconscious, the the environment, the culture, or whatever. And I've just seen you speak on it before, or, or heard you speak on it before during some of the the podcasts, and and maybe even written. I can't remember where I've read it a couple of times. So I just wanted to to bring that up. Um, I was going to ask you, why aren't you a DJ anymore? But we've kind of covered some of that. So I want to hear as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, as a busy person, you probably also have a social life and, and all, all these things. How do you continue to learn about business, about culture, about other things? And, and how do you stay on top of things? You know, it's so funny. I was just thinking about this. Um, so when I worked in radio, I had to... Um, listen to a lot of other radio. Well, this is what I chose to do. So I listened to all kinds of other channels, other kinds of music, um, other kinds of stations to hear what the DJs were doing and to keep on top of it. And then watched a lot of TV, live TV, because people did watch live TV back then. And um, that pop culture, right? And I, I read a lot of magazines because I had to be up on it. And now I don't do any of those things, <laughs> which is kind of crazy um, because partly the world has changed and partly I don't have time. You know, it's amazing. Like I don't read the news anymore and and because um, literally because I don't have time and enough people c will tell you the important things anyways. Right. I mean, it's just part of the deal. Um, but well, mostly you through phone, or you get, you know, you see it on LinkedIn or you see it on Twitter or you see it wherever. Right. Yeah. You just you just. Yeah. Know you just know these things. I mean, if it's important, the, you know, my Slack channel, our, our, we, we have one for customers, but we also, of course, have one internally. And my team is pretty, um, you know, so Chris Bro's wife, I don't know if you know this, he, his is Kate Snow from NBC. I did <laughs> so, know that, yeah. Yeah. Which is pretty so we have cool, a direct right? line. And, well, that's a, yeah. you know, 
or not celebrity. Well, yes, yeah, celebrity, well-known person, whatever. Right. Yeah. That's she's awesome. She's a celebrity. Yeah. And yeah. she's so nice. And, and um, she's a lately customer too, actually. She's, she's great. Um, but yeah, so we have a direct line into, into like real life happenings with her. Um, but the, I mean, the biggest way is um, really just, honestly, I turn everything off. Like, so all my alerts, all that stuff, I can't be distracted. And so it's, it is really other people telling me. Um, but I did want to actually answer your question about why I'm not a rock and roll DJ anymore, because no okay, one, no one has ever asked me that question. And I'll ask you, you why mind? aren't you a DJ? <laughs> Let's do it. Um, I miss it, by the way. I really miss it. Because what I miss is I love the theater of the mind, Colin. I love that I can have a role in what you imagine, you know, because um, it's really powerful. And I miss that having that microphone and that two-way street. It's a little bit different than always being on video all the time. I think I don't like Clubhouse because there's no music involved. I'm not interested in, in talk radio. Um, but I'm interested in creating soundscapes and taking you on a journey and figuring out how this new song connects the older songs of different kinds of of you know rock and roll or folk or jazz how, how they all connect so once in a while and more often than once in a while my husband and I as so we have our whole album and CD collection downstairs and we'll do DJ nights okay. <laughs> and right. um, it's usually like I play a song he say, plays a song and we're both segueing you know, the segue is the, is the thing. How does it mix together? And eventually I elbow him out of the way because I'm, I'm better. <laughs> you <Yes>. know, <laughs> my yes. song choices, I feel, yeah. Um, but the only reason is I don't have time. So if I did have time, if I, the moment, the moment, um, you know, lately allows me to buy my island in, in Borneo, I'll be starting a, a radio show with my husband and um, okay. indulge in that again because it's fun, you know. So you're not a DJ anymore just because you hated DJing. You loved DJing. It sounds like you would love to DJ some more should the opportunity allow itself or present itself again sometime. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't pay. So there's no money in it, right? Like I made in 2006, I made $54,000 a year at the greatest show on earth, literally for radio, right? Which in Washington, D.C., which is not a lot of money. And I'm motivated by money. I'm not afraid to say that. But also, you know, the the confines of what radio is now is not... I was really lucky, Colin. I grew up in radio where we picked our own songs. <laughs> it was live, you know? That's a totally different... People don't know what that's like. You and I know because we're old enough to know that. But, but you know, most people don't know what that's like anymore. Um, and I would, I would love to... Um, I don't want to be the owner. I don't want to own the radio station. I don't want any of that stuff. I just want to have an hour long show where I can walk in and do my thing and walk away. And, yeah. You know, that sounds fun. That sounds awesome. Um, I, I, you know, you talked about the news, you, you talked about we're old to remember the way certain things were. There's a couple of people in my neighborhood hood who still have the, the Dallas morning news that still have the paper delivered to them every morning and they, they read the paper. <laughs> yeah. And I love that. My mom actually still, turns on the news, puts on the news at, you know, five o'clock or five 30 and watches that 30 minute segment of the, yeah. of the news. So, uh, my mom does that yeah. too. Yeah. Those are some, some <laughs> fun things. So, all right, well, we're almost done. So if someone wants to get in touch with, with you or with lately, what is the, uh, the best way to do it? I'll also put it up on the video, but you know, what, what is the best way for somebody to get in touch with you? Thanks so much, Colin. Um, and by the way, I missed the crossword from the paper. <laughs> I miss doing that. Um, sure. so it's, Kate at lately.ai is me and we're at www.lately.ai. Um, and we're always happy to meet new people. And, and especially because people are um, taking lately and using it in ways we don't expect still. So it's really exciting for us to um, just keep, keep learning and, and um, figuring out like, gosh, what, what is this beast we've built here? <laughs> it's still a little bit unclear, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate what lately AI is doing. I personally am an evangelist of the company. I enjoy using it. Like I said, I probably don't use it enough, but I, I did take a few weeks off and, and I, I actually logged in last night. I have nothing scheduled right now. I'm like, oh no, nothing is scheduled. What in the world? So I've got to, uh, 
well, I'll have some stuff scheduled after this, obviously, and, and, and come up with some other stuff. But, you know, to, to everyone who's watching and listening, I encourage you to check it out, particularly if you're looking for a tool uh, from a marketing and social media standpoint to potentially allow you to grow your business, to get your message out. There's so many things that they are doing that I personally think are, are innovative, that I, I think are changing the way. It changed the way I looked at things. Let's, let's put it this way. It changed my day. It changed the structure of my days. But, you know, very, very thankful that Kate agreed to be on this. We had to schedule it like five years ago. I had to reach out to her and she had this, you know, it's like, <laughs> I can do it in April of 2021. Um, but no, she's she really is <laughs> on a a podcast, um, a, a video circuit, if you will, and, and puts out a lot of great information. So thank you, thank you, Kate. Um, thank you to all the listeners. Like I said, we're going to be pushing out the uh, vulnerability tour, or continuing the vulnerability tour, twenty twenty one, here pretty soon. And I appreciate the feedback. I appreciate the text. Um, I appreciate the comments and. Please feel free to, to share it with somebody. I'd I like to get the message out. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Kate. And hope to talk to you soon.